Hey, y'all seen that young boy, Chris Mann? Nah, I haven't seen him in about a minute. Yeah, he been in my Communication that matters. Tonight, see how educators are teaching clarity in the classroom for students to broaden their language skills. It's all part of code switching, and it is what matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. Language, it's the way we're understood to each other, but it's really much more. In every language, there are differences. Differences in the way we speak when we're in boardrooms and barbecues, presentations and parties, conferences and clubs. When we switch from formal to informal speech, it's called code switching. But for people who don't know how to code switch, who speak informally all the time, whether by choice or by intent, the effects can be costly. Lisa Godley's been considering the issue in an upcoming documentary called Code Switching, and she joins us tonight, along with Rachel Swords, who's a Title I reading and math interventionist in Newport News. Richard Coleman is the retired executive director of the Achievable Dream Academy in Newport News, and Dr. Joan Scheibman is a linguist and a professor at Old Dominion University in Norfolk. Thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. So this is such an interesting subject, Lisa, and I wonder how you got interested in the idea. Well, actually, the idea came to us from someone who um, found himself in a situation where he had a very good relationship with a young lady who was a friend of a friend of his or a relative of a friend of his, and he could speak French to her because she was learning French in high school, but when she spoke um, slang mm -hmm. or African-American vernacular English, uh, he couldn't understand what she was saying. Interesting. And, and he was heartbroken that they couldn't continue their conversations because oh, he didn't know what she was saying. And you used a term, African-American vernacular English. And we probably ought to take a moment to sort of define some of those terms, because I know you had to sort of really <laughs> research that and figure out what we're talking about. Back in the 70s, we had a term called Ebonics. Uh, then we had a term called Black English, and we may still have that term. You said African-American vernacular English, and then I've also heard just African-American American English. English yeah. so, so what's your take on sort of those uh, definitions? Is that an evolutionary yeah, situation? Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all the same. Yeah. It's one and the same. Okay. And so the implications of this are, are what? What does your research demonstrate? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about my aha moment. Yeah. Um, I was in the middle of the research early in the spring. And I was reading the, a resolution that was written by the Oakland School Board back in 1996, where they were asking to teach African-American vernacular, they called it Ebonics mm -hmm. at the time. They wanted to use that as a way to teach the students standard English. But everything, it was a catalyst for the whole Ebonics debate because the resolution was so poorly worded that the reporters who covered the situation in the beginning only read a portion of it mm. and they heard teach Ebonics and it blew up. It was right. all over the oh, news, it was, it was everywhere. And nightmare. the poor school board, that wasn't what they were trying to do. If they had read just a few more words, right. they would have seen take the students from where they are yeah. to where they need to be, which is all educators ever really want to exactly. do is to take them from where they are to where they want to be. They yeah. didn't want to teach Ebonics. If I come in from Russia, I don't have to, you don't have to teach me Russian. I, yeah. I, you need to teach me standard English. Yeah. And the kids knew it. Yeah. They knew it. Interesting. So. Uh, so set up this first clip for us from, from, the, from the program. Well, the beginning, the first clip is the definition of code switching. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the first um, couple of minutes of the documentary, and it explains what we're delving into. No, I haven't seen him in about a minute. Yeah, he been in my age, dog. No, I ain't seen him in like two weeks. Code switching is being able to move between variations of language in different situations or settings. In fact, everyone who speaks can and probably has code switched, depending on the circumstance. Hey, hey girl, what's up? Not too much. Hello, how are you? Hi. Code switching can involve alternating between two different languages. For example, 11-year-old Erica Mojica speaks both standard English and Tagalog, the Filipino language she's heard her parents speak since she was old enough to talk. They speak English, like to me, and they speak Tagalog like when they're with friends. Erica says she often switches when talking to friends who also know Tagalog. Alicadito, yeah, that means come over here and say, mabaho naman, and that means smells, like this place smells. 
the more common forms of code switching is a dialectical shift within the same language, because while 80% of Americans speak English, we do not all speak the same version. There are scores of different dialects spoken right here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The two heard most often are Southern American English, y'all gotta go, and its cousin, African American Vernacular English, or Black English, also known as Ebonics. You ain't gotta go home, but you gotta get the heck out of here. You have to leave. For years, the latter, African American Vernacular English, or AAVE for short, has been the subject of controversy. Some argue that it should be used in the classroom as a means of teaching standard English to children who've only been exposed to AAVE, while others insist that it should never be used in any formal educational setting, and that it only disables African American children. That is not our debate. Our focus is on a person's ability to code switch between African American vernacular English and standard English, and how the inability to do so is impacting lives. And that's just a bit of the code switching documentary, which will be airing Monday, September 27th at 8 p.m. And then it'll rebroadcast Sunday, October 3rd at 4 p.m. Uh, it's also nice to have Dr. Joanne Scheidman with us, who's a linguist from Old Dominion University. Welcome and thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you know, you this was me. so interesting because, uh, you know, it seems to me that this language really is about much more than just a, a, a thing or a way we communicate. Uh, and, and a lot of your research, I know, is sort of focused on that question of language as a, as a social construct. Yes. Um, you know, linguists, but all speakers, we talk about language as though it's an object, as though it's something out there. And part of what goes with that is we think that there must be a correct way to use it and an incorrect way to use it. But really, language is what we're using, like right now, in right. interaction as I'm talking to you. And so that, that implicitly means that language has different purposes and who we talk to affects. Yeah. Um, so who, who decides what's correct and incorrect? I mean, I, I mean that's a, yeah. how do we dis describe or how do we decide what language is correct and what is incorrect? It dep I, w I would say it depends on the task. So if you work for a newspaper, then there's a style. Right that, you know, for uniformity. And probably the closest that American English has to some kind of ideal or standard type is the written language. Mm. You know, because uh, all of us who speak different dialects, we, we kind of come together and communicate with the written language. And it's my understanding that's part of the controversy yeah. of uh, about uh, talking about African American English, which is helping some of the kids learn to write in standard English. Right. And so it's interesting because you also think this has something to do with power. I do. Power in cultures and societies. How so? I do. Power and, uh, and issues of identity. Mm -hmm. So as I said, language is really every, every moment or every performance that we're talking to each other for different purposes. Right. But that gets conventionalized. We don't have to reinvent it. But whoever, the groups that have the power in a culture or a society, that becomes what's called the prestige variant or the prestige oh, dialect. And that is what people refer to as the language of wider communication or standard American English. Um, and because that, what, did, what did you call that again? The prestige? It's the prestige dialect. Interesting. And this changes over time. Yeah. So it's no accident that dialects like African American English or certain varieties of New York English or Southern American English are the dialects that are stereotyped as incorrect. It's because of the attitudes about the people. Fascinating. We're glad to have Rachel Swords with us as well. She's a Title I reading and math interventionist. Uh, Title I, of course, a, a program, it's an income-based uh, program. Right. And so most of the students who are in your schools come from families that are, I would say, probably socially disadvantaged. Yes. And so give us a sense of how you see this issue playing out in your own school. I just see that students come to the school, they, they don't have a sense of standard English. They know there's another way of speaking out there. They're just not sure how to get to that point. Hmm. And we do a lot of correcting, which we know doesn't work or we wouldn't be having this conversation. But the students come in and they'll say something like, um, is we going outside today? And they'll be told, we don't say is, we say are. And a few minutes later, they'll say, 
Are Susan going out with us too? Because you just said don't say is. Are you, it's confusing. We don't, we're not teaching how to get from one place to the next. And that's where this code switching that's piece where code switching uh, switching has, has come into uh, the conversation. Lisa said earlier this, this business of the fact is it wasn't about uh, just teaching a particular African American English situation. It was a, a bridge to, to get something to where else. They to be, yes. Yeah. Uh, Richard Coleman, nice to have you with us nice and congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. you must feel so good about what's going on at an Achievable Dream Academy. I miss it every day. I know you must. I tell you, that, that is uh, the work of a lifetime, no yeah. question about it. So tell us how this issue hits home for you because it seems to me that an Achievable Dream Academy is a, sort, of, sort of in some respects a living lab around these issues. Yes, actually, at Achievable dream uh, the code switching piece we we focus on teaching our children what we call proper business English um, proper business English and I come from the corporate world prior to going into public education and we found that uh, navigating through the English language in a business environment is what we want our kids to be able to do uh, we, we're focusing on their academics we want them to get an education we want them to go to college but we don't want any glass ceilings when they get there because of how they speak however we also talk to them about it's okay to speak the other vernacular it's okay to speak as we call it slang uh, in the neighborhood because we know that uh, there's a comfort level with that we know it's a defense mechanism and we don't want them to feel uncomfortable um, speaking a certain way in their community and in speaking a certain way uh, in the school so we teach them that it's okay mm -hmm. to code switch yeah and, and so this is a uh, sort of the uh, the idea is to move from correctivist uh, to a situation where you're, uh, you're 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 just doing an alternative uh, but Joanne Scheidman you think this is a little bit con there's controversy there's there controversy, is controversy, about controversy about this. and 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 I th and the part Part, um, you asked me about power a little yeah. while ago, but, but something else that's really important about language use is it's a way that we convey our identities. Not only our individual identities, but our, our identities as members of groups. So speaking uh, mainstream English or standard English in inevitably brings with it the values of primarily, you know, a culture where, you know, white people are generally in power. And so it's not just a question always of learning another code, mm. because what comes with it are attitudes about it. Mm. And it could be people are, and rightly so, don't want to give up their group membership. Their sense of identity. Yeah. And this is one of the things that uh, Lisa's been looking at in this documentary called Code Switching, which airs Monday, September 27th at 8. And I think in just a few minutes, we're going to hear from some young people who, who are addressing this very issue uh, and, and are kind of thinking through whether they choose to code switch or not. But before that, we have, a, we have another clip that we have sets all this out. Two professionals yeah. who talk about code switching, um, how they came to code switch, um, being raised code switching, and they function, that's the way they function. Let's take a look. I'm from the Midwest. And there are a lot of euphemisms and a lot of colloquialisms that that we speak at home and that I say to my, my mother and my aunts and we all understand each other and I've actually talked to my daughter. But when we're in, on, in the professional field, we all speak um, standard English. And, and even now, I mean, I have, gosh, how many years of education? Ten years of education and I recognize it, but I know still that I'm, I'm embodying my culture. I'm embodying where I was raised. So I might say, is you coming? <laughs> you know, like that. Um, and, but, you know, if I'm talking to a, another professional or if I'm talking to, you know, at a, you know, you know, job interview or in the classroom, I'll use professional English. My family, we're first generation college people. I grew up in the ghettos of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, for years, there was only one way that you really spoke. And, and those would be my formative years I'm talking about. And in living in the ghetto, you have to be able to speak like people in the ghetto. As I moved into middle school, you start appreciating um, different English and learning um, how to speak a different way. And all of us um, excelled in school. And so we learned really another language that was never used in our community. Um, and, and still in that community, um, in the ghettos of Richmond, still um, is not used um, that often. But it was really through the educational piece, uh, through the school system, that we learned um, the other language. But at the same time, it was always important that you're able to transition back. 
really, really interesting. I appreciate how he was saying appreciating a different way. I mean, that's such a, an intriguing way to think about it. Um, I, I want to quickly get to the third clip just because I think that will, uh, first of all, I want to make sure we get it into the show. <laughs> we, you know, this is an interesting conversation. Sometimes we lose track of time. Uh, but it's also a, a great jumping off point for uh, the rest of the conversation. So set this third one up for us. We spoke to some young people mm -hmm. and they talked about it. I asked them, okay, well, why? You know, um, what do you think about all this? And yeah. why do you think some people, your same age, aren't switching? Why do you think uh, there are some young people out there that have decided, I'm just not going to do it? So it's it. not that they necessarily don't know how, but they're choosing not to? Yes. Okay. Now, these young people who we spoke with do. They okay. switch. They understand the importance of it. They're in college. Yeah. But they explain why they think. Some of their friends are saying, I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore. All right. Let's take a look. Norfolk State University students Eric Hellams III and Latifa Lanclos both understand the importance of code switching, and each believes they know why a growing number of their peers aren't switching. So everybody now like so confident, like, oh yeah, I'm black, I can speak how I want to speak, whoever, I don't care if you're wearing a suit or not, I can speak whoever I want to speak, because they're so confident in how they speak, but they don't know sometimes that you have to turn it off and turn it on. Eric sees things a little differently. He sees young people growing up in communities and homes where mainstream English isn't spoken, and too many schools focusing on writing and paying very little attention to how you speak. I believe that young African Americans are used to hearing the slang terms and being brought up that way within the families, and then you have a lot of teachers that don't correct them and so that's getting them comfortable and getting them used to saying it a lot. So that's why they continue to use it as they get older. So we can't put it all on the teachers. You have to want to know, want to learn. And I think with that willingness to want to get what it is the teacher is teaching, you're gonna get it. That's what the kids of today have to, have to realize. If the teacher's teaching, take it home. Take home what you've learned and go over it constantly. That's the only way you're gonna grasp it. My mother, she didn't finish school. So it was kind of like, I didn't learn the proper English then. But like the rest of her classmates studying to get their GEDs, Carolyn Barnes is well aware that learning standard English is key to career advancement and a better life. It's, you have to learn it because you're not gonna get far. You're not going to be able to get the big jobs or all that. You're not even going to be able to get a little job if you don't know standard English. Code switching airing Monday, September 27th at 8 p.m. You know, I wonder, Rachel Swords, the, the young man in the piece talked about the difference between writing and speaking, and I was really struck by that. Uh, I wonder how that plays out for you in your classrooms. Um, we, I start with writing because that's, you can edit that. You can go back and say, oh, I didn't do this or I need to do that. And you can't do that when you're, you don't do that when you're sure. speaking. You don't stop and say, oh, wait, let me go back and, and rephrase that. You generally don't do that. But writing allows you to practice. And then with the students reading their writing aloud, they're able to practice standard English. Mm. And we did a lot of different sorts of writing when I was a classroom teacher. I had my kids fill out job applications for classroom jobs, and, and we practiced the kind of interview questions you'd be asked in responding using standard English. Um, I was involved in project-based learning, and the students presented their projects to the public, and we practiced ahead of time. It's, you have to practice the language in order yeah. to get a, to get a like handle on it. It's like any language, right? Yes, I mean, yes. Yeah. You can't just, yeah, you don't walk into a room and yeah. somebody says, we're going to start speaking Spanish now, and, exactly. and you know it. It, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Indeed so. Uh, you know, this was an interesting point, too. One of the guests said, uh, one of the speakers talked about uh, language, uh, standard English being a key to a better life. There's a lot implied in that, I think, Dr. Scheidman. There, there is, and actually Richard and I were talking about this a little bit uh, when, before, the, before yeah. we came in here, which is the idea that um, young kids need to learn to command the prestige dialect, standard right. American English. Uh, for economic reasons and to communicate with the wider, wider culture. At the same time, because of, because of the other social issues, I mean, there is racism in this country, um, it, it may or may not be enough, but it won't at least because, it w excuse me, it won't be because one doesn't speak standard English mm -hmm. 
that they didn't get the job, and maybe mm. for some other reason at least. And that, that's worthy. Yeah. I, mean, I wonder how you've seen this evolve over time, uh, Richard, because this is, it has been an evolution, the way we think about this. Yes, it has. And, and I must say that it, it really is important that, that we've noticed when our kids started speaking proper business English, it affected their writing as well. And oh, so we had improved test scores, particularly over the last seven or eight years. Our eighth grade writing scores uh, started to improve because what they were hearing uh, was what they would be writing. Mm -hmm. And so it, it made a, dif a significant difference. I wonder what about this question Dr. Scheidman's raising about the question of identity. Yeah. Because if you're saying this is business English, yeah. you know, this is, this is the world in which we operate, and it doesn't sound like the language that you speak at home, what is well, that? Well, you know, interesting. I, I grew up in the projects of New York, and my mother uh, had all of us focus on speaking proper business English. And I think her intent was that in the world out here, I want my children to be successful. And I have a pretty good understanding that if they speak English correctly, they have a better chance of moving forward. That may not always be the case, but that was yeah. her belief at the time. And, yeah. and it, it, Achievable Dream, I've seen the same thing. I've watched as our kids have gone on to college, so some of them have taken on corporate positions, and it certainly is in, in their best interest to speak the proper business English. You know, I'm wondering too, Lisa, as you think about this issue, did you in any respect come into this project with an idea? Uh, did you have that idea then solidified, or did you change your mind in the course of the program? Oh, went back and forth a little bit, yeah. but pretty much, I mean, I grew up code switching. Uh -huh. I remember sitting around the table saying, should have gone, should have, should have went. And my mother uh -huh. would say, should have gone yeah. on the table. And um, I just, I remember, I, I just remember growing up. So I knew when I, through the research, that I, it wasn't, didn't surprise me the 80 to 90 percent of African Americans code switch. That didn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. It all depends on the situation and how much. That depends on the individual. Yeah. But that didn't surprise me because I know, you know, in my own social circles, sure. I, you know, the conversation yeah. just constantly changes. I think that's what's so important about a program like this that really uh, is, is a window into something we might not ordinarily think about. Uh, I remember, and I told you this before we went on the air, but I can remember uh, in, in a colleague situation, having an African American colleague who was speaking in a meeting, and then she took a phone call and started speaking African American English, and a white colleague looked at me and sort of rolled his eyes and said, okay, so which one's real? And it, 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 they're both real. I mean, they're all real, yeah, they right? Are. I mean, that's that, but I think that's what's important about having these kinds of conversations, because you can you can begin to talk about those issues and, and think them through a little bit. Um, Dr. Scheidman, where do you see this going? I, what, where I hope it goes is that this kind of a show um, and Lisa's uh, documentary will be useful and, the, and the, the, what it will do is raise awareness because one of the recommendations is to raise linguistic awareness and dialect awareness to understand that, you know, we're talking about African American English, but African American English is a bunch of different varieties. Right, right, right. And so when we, when we you, you know, the word Ebonics is sometimes used just to talk about kind of an, an urban variety, working class variety, yeah. etc. cetera. So um, I, what I hope is uh, there's dialect awareness for teachers, that there is some true diversity right. in school where the, where the language that the kids come in with is truly valued, mm -hmm. whether it's, it's brought up in literature classes or in other classes, so that there is not so much of a disparate, um, so much of a boundary yeah. between here's uh, language of wider communication, standard English, and um, African American varieties. I love conversations like this because these are the things that happen in our everyday lives, and we're going about living our lives. We don't even think about this stuff. And it's all deep and it all has meaning. Congratulations, Lisa. I, I know it's a wonderful Thank project. So much. And uh, everybody will be able to see it on Monday, September 27th at 8 p.m. right here on WHRO TV 15. It'll be rebroadcast Sunday, October 3rd at 4 p.m. Thanks to our guests. And I'll be back in a moment with a note about Transit Week. Ridden the bus lately? If you hurry, you can still sign up for Tri Transit Week that wraps up tonight. It started in 2005 to try to get Richmonders out of that lonely one driver per car trip. 
Three years later, they extended it statewide. The challenge is for us to try a form of transit, to experience firsthand the benefits it can offer. In this area, of course, you may find a bus that can get you where you want to go. And in May, you'll be able to climb aboard a light rail train in Norfolk. Now, depending on where you live, it may not be easy to take transit. But if you work at it, I suspect you can probably find at least one trip you might be able to share with your friends and neighbors. And if the bus doesn't work for you, how about considering sharing the ride? HRT's traffics program will help you find riders near you, and they'll get you a ride home if you have an emergency that complicates your carpool during the day. And if your carpool gets too big, you can share the rental of a traffics van. And if you sign up for a Tri Transit Week tonight, you'll be able automatically entered to win a pass to the transit service of your choice to ride free for a whole year and two round-trip tickets on Amtrak Virginia. More importantly than that, though, the stakes are really huge. Listen to this. If we could each leave our car at home one day out of ten, we could end peak hour congestion without building another mile of road. Can you imagine that? We don't have to be buffeted by the political winds of transportation funding. This is something we actually have it in our own power to fix. You also have the ability to watch any of our programs online at whatmatters.tv, and I hope you'll join us on 89.5 for more talk at the noon hour. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you next week for another look at What Matters.